I'm Desiree Chapel. I'm a practicing CRNA and serve as the Vice President of Clinical Quality for North Star Anesthesia. This video covers intraoperative hypotension. Hypotension may seem like a simple problem. However, evidence has demonstrated that it is much more common and more harmful than we might have previously thought. A prolonged amount of time with a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters of mercury has been repeatedly associated with an increased risk of acute kidney injury as well as myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery, also known as MINS. Some might assume that a little bit of hypotension is okay, but as Wessel Link and colleagues demonstrated, even one minute with a mean arterial pressure under 55 millimeters of mercury has been associated with increased risk. To better understand the risk of hypotension, in 2021, Gregory and colleagues looked at over 300,000 surgeries to evaluate the association of IOH and adverse clinical outcomes in non-cardiac surgery. The data showed us that lower mean blood pressure thresholds were strongly associated with increased risk. In fact, harm can start at higher pressures around 75 millimeters of mercury. The study also highlighted that these risks remain, whether your patient is young and healthy versus older patients with more comorbidities and higher ASA scores. In addition to avoiding dips in blood pressure, we've also learned that the cumulative time of hypotension may be harmful. As recently as 2020, Shaw and colleagues from MPOG, the multi-center perioperative outcomes group from Michigan, evaluated data from 11 medical centers. They found that hypotension occurred in 88% of patients with an average of 28.2 minutes mean duration. As presented at the 2022 meetings for the ASA and the PGA, I was part of a project where two large national anesthesia groups evaluated real-world data, primarily from non-academic community practices, and measured the amount of IOH within a cohort of 127,000 patients. We found that 29% of patients had IOH, defined as a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters of mercury, for a cumulative time of at least 15 minutes. For all 127,000 patients, the average time with IOH was 12.4 minutes. That includes patients that did not meet that measure of a total of 15 minutes cumulative hypotension. The 29% of patients who met the measure had a mean time of a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters of mercury for 36.2 minutes. Surprisingly, a large portion of hypotension occurred in the slightly healthier patients and in cases lasting around two to three hours. Ultimately, we found that the greatest predictor of the amount of hypotension was not patient-specific factors, but rather the variation among clinicians. This has provided us with a major opportunity for quality improvement and standardization of practice. IOH is undeniably an issue that anesthesia clinicians face in the OR every day. So how do we treat it and how do we avoid it? Should we give more vasopressors or fluids intraoperatively? In a retrospective study published in 2022, Choi and colleagues investigated the trends of fluid and vasopressor utilization. Using the MPOG data, this study evaluated patients from 2015 to 2019 who had an elective major abdominal surgery. They found that over time, the amount of intraoperative fluids decreased and vasopressor utilization increased. While there was initially a slight dip in AKI in the first year, the rate increased considerably over the study period. This study reveals that by choosing vasopressors over fluids to maintain pressure, iatrogenic harm may occur that we may never see in the operating room. To better understand this physiology, let's go into the virtual lab to observe the hemodynamics of a porcine model, which is used because of the similarity with humans. As a clinician, this may look very familiar to you. The standard monitors are present and all the values are within normal range. Though if you had access to the blood loss, you would see a hemorrhage of 588 milliliters, which represents approximately 10% circulating volume. This amount of volume may not necessarily be detectable with traditional variables, such as heart rate and blood pressure, as you can see here. However, when we look at the advanced hemodynamic monitoring, you can visualize when the hemorrhage was initiated and see the trends over time. Take a moment to focus on the one parameter that has changed the most with the hemorrhage, the Acumen Hypotension Prediction Index, or HPI. This parameter detects hemodynamic instability and alerts the clinician of impending hypotension. Acumen HPI parameter is explained in several of the other critical insight videos.
At the same time as the hemorrhage, the microcirculation of the intestinal microvilli was examined using a specialized imaging camera in the gut. On the left, you can see a perfectly healthy GI tract. The blood flow is continuous. The imaging on the right shows the gut after a modest hemorrhage. The microvilli are starting to blanch and the flow has started to become pulsatile. The blood flow to the gut is impaired to maintain central blood volume and flow to the vital organs. Further into the hemorrhage, the patient has become hypotensive. The researchers treated the hypotension with vasopressors, bringing the blood pressure back into normal range. Everything is looking as though they chose the correct treatment, or so it seemed. The blood pressure is normalized, and our macro hemodynamics are better. However, the tissue in the gut microvilli is suffering. As before, we see normal circulation within the microvilli on the left. And now we have almost completely stagnant flow on the right. It's become ischemic. Anesthesia clinicians may never realize this potential issue or see any other downstream consequences of IOH, like post-op nausea and vomiting, or potentially AKI. While we think that 500 milliliters of blood loss may not be clinically significant, this example demonstrates that treating hypotension caused by hypovolemia using vasopressors and not replacing volume loss can potentially have long-term effects for our patients. Understanding the physiology and hemodynamics, as well as using a goal-directed approach to manage the underlying cause of hypotension, can help you avoid iatrogenic harm caused by IOH. A goal-directed approach first addresses the patient's fluid status, then the flow or cardiac output, and if hypotension persists, hypotension is then treated with vasopressors. To learn more about targeted hemodynamic management, you might want to check out the fill flow pressure video in this series. If you're interested in the physiology lab we mentioned or the Acumen HPI software, there is a wealth of content on the Edwards Clinical Education website, as well as the Acumen HPI learning portal. Tune in to the next Critical Insights episode, where we'll continue our conversation on advanced monitoring. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to stay up to date on clinical educational videos, symposium recordings, and more.